We learn from the book of Exodus that God called out to Moses and said, come up here, write this down, tell the people the following, I am the Lord thy God who brought you out of slavery and bondage and I set you free. You shall have no other gods before me. In the New Testament, Jesus is asked by a young man, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus, who perfectly fulfilled the Old Testament law, says, and he addresses this question, he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. Both statements implicitly and explicitly say, you shall have no other gods or idols before me. I am your God. As much as we try not to, we all grab onto idols. And that's a problem. We fall into the trap of lifting up worthless idols and sin. But the Word of God says that if we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. I welcome you today into the house of the Lord. And as we come today, we need to have clean hands, we need to have a pure heart, and we need to... Uh, address that and admit that we lift up idols and we need to cast them out today so that we can all boldly step through the veil into the holy of holies and worship him in spirit and in truth today would you stand please make this prayer be your prayer father we bow our hearts to you we bend our knees to you today Make us humble and help us to confess our sin and cast down the idols that we so easily grab onto and put in place of you. May our worship today, may our worship today give you a smile, make you pleased, and uplift you and declare you to be holy, righteous, and pure. You are God. And we thank you and praise you for your grace, mercy, and love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's sing this song. Lift it up to him. We bow our hearts. We bend our knees. Oh, Spirit, come make us humble. Cast down our idols, give us clean hands, and give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Give us clean hands, give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another.
have a seat, give each other a nice greeting this morning, and welcome to the house of the Lord. Be seated for a moment here. We get started today in our in our time of worship. Just a couple quick and uh, reminders. We have bulletins. Please make sure you pick them up. All the announcements are there. They've been up on the screen uh, before service. One thing: the um, the congregational care lists are in the boxes, so we want to make sure everyone avails themselves to that. So check your box today uh, if, if you have a box back there, and we would uh, love to have you pick those up so everyone can be versed and what that is, uh, what your new groups are, okay? So, back there. As we uh, have the privilege to come into the Holy of Holies, Jesus tore that veil in two when his blood was rent on the cross. And we have access to God that we never had before. We have that today. So I invite you, we're going to concentrate on Jesus this morning and praise him this morning with these next two songs. Let me just pray that your heart's lifted up and uh, your spirit is lifted and your spirit is turned to our wonderful Savior. Would you stand, please? Yeah. 
Gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you this morning for who you are, that you would care so much about us, that you sent Jesus into this world to walk this world, to understand the highs and lows that we experience in this world. And not only that, but you call us your children, your, your friends. You long to be in relationship with with us. You know us intimately and you long for us to know you intimately. And so we bless you and we thank you for that. God, we love you and we pray this in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, I'm glad to see several of you here. I know some people lost power last night. Anyone else who lost power last night? Yeah, and I know there's a lot of people in the area that still have power off. I think we lost about three or four times. I woke up to like 15 text messages from Consumers Energy this morning saying, your power's off, your power's on, your power's off, your power's on. And I was just glad when I got here this morning, power was on at church because it said it wasn't going to come on until 4 o'clock this afternoon. So I'm glad to be here with you this morning. And one of the reasons I'm so glad is this morning we get to have a really cool celebration. We get to celebrate a young man in our church family who uh, is at the point in his walk with Jesus that he wants to come and make his profession of faith this morning. So this morning we get to celebrate um, that our elders at Forest Grove have welcomed Jordan Rodenhaus, who has been baptized into the body of Christ, appeared before them to make his profession of his Christian faith. And so this morning we're going to ask him to declare his faith before God and Christ's church that we can rejoice together with him in what God has been doing in Jordan's life. So this morning, I want to invite Jordan to come forward. Um, Fred, one of our elders, uh, Jesse, one of his mentors, is going to come up as well. And as they're waking, making their way up, in our tradition in the Reformed Church, um, you can see it right over here, guys. Um, in our Reformed tradition, right, we, bat we believe in baptizing our littlest ones. And so we take the waters of baptism, and uh, just like next week, we're actually going to baptize two of our little ones next week. And we baptize, and we say when we baptize that we don't have it all figured out, but God is giving his grace upon our children. And we pray and we long for the day when our children will be able to stand publicly and say, yes, I am following Jesus, that the, the promises we make in these waters of baptism have come to fruition. And so this morning, that's true of, of Jordan. He's been in a, a mentorship program that we put together um, with Jesse, which if you don't know Jesse, Jesse is Brooke's husband. Um, and he has been wa walking with um, Jordan for several months now, going through a little process of saying, what is it that he actually believes? And it's been a joy. Uh, Fred is up here as one of his youth sponsors and has gotten to know Jesse and then obviously Brooke, our youth director, and seeing how God has been at work in Jordan's life over the last, uh, over the years, but really in the last few months. Uh, Jordan shared with us that there has been some things that gone on, a friend who passed away, and that really spurred him on to trying to figure out what is his faith all about and really making it his own. So I'm just so excited for you to be here this morning. I'm so proud of you for being here this morning. Um, 
And so this morning, as we make your public profession of faith, I have a few questions for you um, to, to be able to share with your brothers and sisters out here. Beloved in, of God, I ask you before God and Christ church to reject evil, to profess your faith in Jesus Christ, and to confess the faith of the church. Jordan, do you renounce sin and the power of evil in your life and in the world? Do you profess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Will you, be faithful mem- will you be a faithful member of this congregation and through worship and service seek to advance God's purposes here and throughout the world? Do you promise to accept the spiritual guidance of this church, to walk in a spirit of Christian love with this congregation and to seek those things that make for unity, purity, and peace? Amen. I want to invite the congregation to stand. And uh, as... When Jordan was baptized in the family of God, the congregation that he was baptized before made promises, and we got to see those fulfilled today. But we also want to continue making promises to Jordan to help him to continue to grow in his faith. And so I ask you, the congregation here at Forest Grove, to answer this question. Do you promise to love, encourage, and support Jordan by teaching the gospel of God's love, by being an example of Christian faith and character, and by giving the strong support of God's family in fellowship, prayer, and service. If you respond in the affirmative, we do. Thank you. If you want to stay standing, we're going to share together what the church has echoed down the canyons of time for a long time, of what it is that we believe through the words of the Lord's Prayer. And they're going to be, or not the Lord's Prayer, the Apostles' Creed, excuse me. And they're going to be up on the screen. There's a screen down here you guys can look at too if you want. I believe in God the Father Almighty creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Congregation, you may be seated. Jordan, why don't you come over here a little closer? I promise I put deodorant on this morning, so I'm not too smelly. Um, so this is our baptismal font. Or again, like I said earlier, we're going to baptize a couple kids next week. Um, but I want to invite you to, to dip your hands in the water there, to remember your baptism, to remember that you are a child of God, that before you knew it, God placed his promises upon you, that by his grace you're standing here with us today that those baptismal waters have come true, that Jesus has done an incredible work in your life to bring you to this point. And we are so excited to see how God's going to continue to work in your life so that you can witness to the ends of the earth about what Jesus has done and continues to do in your life. So Jordan, remember that you have been baptized, that you are sealed with the Holy Spirit, and that you are marked as Christ's own forever and called to follow him in mission. Let me pray for you. If you guys want to come over and lay hands on him, you're welcome to. Father God, we bless you and thank you for your servant, Jordan. We thank you that in your grace, you have been doing a miraculous work in his life. We thank you for the people who have poured into him, the Sunday school teachers, the youth group leaders, Uh, family and friends that have poured into him so that he could stand here today with us and say, yes, I believe in Jesus and I want the world to know it. And so, Lord, we pray that you would just continue to send your spirit upon Jordan, that he would have the strength that each and every day he would be able to walk in your ways and walk in your will to the glory of your holy name until that glorious day when you call him into your eternal kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen.
join me, congregation, in welcoming Jordan into our family. Jordan, by the Holy Spirit, we believe and are baptized, receive a ministry to witness to Jesus as Savior and Lord, and to love and to serve those whom we live and work. We are ambassadors for Christ, who reconciles and makes whole. We are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. Jordan, I just want to say I'm proud of you, and I'm excited to see how God will continue to work in your life. Congratulations, brother. Thank you. Be seated. And for those who might be interested in, in uh, making a profession of faith like Jordan did this morning, I, wow. I encourage you to chat with myself or with Brooke at some time, and we'll get you connected with that. But with that said, I want to invite our kids up front, and we're going to have our children's message with Brooke this morning. Yeah, come on up. I heard we had a special guest who had the box today, so I'm interested to see what I get here. <laughs> All right, just a couple of you guys. Thank you. So, Eliza, who had the box today? Daddy. Your dad did? Yeah. If you guys don't know, that's, that's Chris in the back. <laughs> All right, you want to show me what he put in there? Honey. Oh, bees. honey. Bees, honey. Bees, honey. Do you guys have bees at your house? Yeah. Do you ever help them with getting the honey? Or does your dad and your mom do that? My dad does, and my brother helps. And your sometimes. brother helps? Cool. Cool. And this year, my brother did not help because he was <laughs> at Camp Geneva. Oh. And me too. You guys were at Camp Geneva this week? Awesome. Awesome. Nice. So is this, is this honey even better than like what you can buy in the store? Yes. Yeah, it's I bet. It's sweeter than last year's. Sweeter than last year's? Nice, nice. Monroe, have you ever had, had honey straight from a bee's hive, or do you guys just buy it at the store? Yeah. Buy it at the store? You can nice. Keep it. I can keep it? Oh my goodness, thank you. I don't know if I've ever had any like this. And sometimes from bees. You've had it sometimes from the bees? Awesome. I don't know that I ever have, so I'm excited to go home and try this. Thank and, you. That's very nice. Yeah, we, my mom bought the bottles. Oh, your mom bought the bottles. Sweet. Sweet. Awesome. Do you guys know of, of any time in the, in the Bible when it talks about honey? Can you think of anything? No, it's a very specific phrase that I'm thinking of. So sometimes in the Bible, in the Old Testament, when they're thinking about, do you guys know what the promised land is? Does that sound familiar a little bit? It's where when the Israelites leave leave Egypt and they're wandering in the desert, they're traveling to the promised land in Israel, which God promised to them. And a phrase that they'll often use to talk about the promised land is they'll talk about uh, the land of milk and honey. So it's this idea of how it's going to be, be sweet like, like honey, and it's going to be a good, good land for them. And so that's what this, this little thing of honey made me think of, and how this might even be sweeter and better than maybe that honey that we get in the store. That was a, a promise from God that was going to be sweet and good for the Israelites. That's what that makes me think of this morning. Can you guys think of, of any promises from God that maybe he gives to us? Maybe it's a little different than a specific land that he promises to us, but can you think of any promises from God that might be sweet Maybe even we talked about if you just saw Jordan make his profession of faith, we talked about the promises that, that God gives us at baptism and how uh, including Jordan and all of us are, are children of God and that, he, that the congregation even makes promises to us when we're baptized. They promise to, to help, help us learn about the Bible and, and to disciple us as we grow up. And then we can celebrate profession of faith like that with Jordan too and others when they when they decide to to have make promises to God and, and the congregation can make promises to them to love them and to continue to to teach them about God so 
When we think of this honey, let's think about God's, God's promises that are sweet like honey, like the promised land and other, other promises that God gives us, like eternal life and salvation. All right. And the bottles are really cheap. The bottles are really cheap, I was told. All right, good to know. Good to know. All right. Monroe, would you like the box for next week? Yes. You would? All right. He said, yes, please. So maybe he's got an idea over there. All right, so I'm going to pray, and then do we have the sucker jar? Are we missing the sucker jar? We're missing it? Okay, well, (laughs) Dan, I guess, might run and go get our sucker jar. And then you guys do have uh, children's worship this morning, so you guys can head to the back if you want to go to that. And and me and my grandma and my brother and my grandpa went to a garage sale, and I got clothes for my American Girl dolls and a new one. Oh, my goodness. A real one. The other one was practice. Okay, okay. Good to know. Good to know. And you were and you were at Camp Geneva too, right? Mm-hmm. Did you have a good week? I had a day camp. You had day camp. Okay. Good. Good. I was too young to sleep there. Oh, okay. And Monroe had fun. We had we had our water day on Thursday with a bunch of the kids and the daycare kids, which was fun too. All right, there's a sucker jar. Thank you, Pastor Dan. All right, we're gonna pray and then you guys can go get a sucker. So let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this morning. Um, Thank you that we had power here at church so that we could gather together. Um, And I just thank you for especially the opportunity to celebrate Jordan's profession of faith this morning. And I just thank you for all the family and friends that are here to support him for that. Um, Lord, I just thank you for the the promises that you give to us through our baptism and that we get to to celebrate um, your faithfulness through celebrating a profession of faith. And um, I thank you for these kids up here this morning and those that couldn't be here today. And I just pray that they will come to know you more and more and come to know the promises that you've given to them through, through their baptism and that someday they can be up there making profession of faith as well and coming to know you as their Lord and Savior. Um, be with us the rest of this day and bless these kids in children's worship and all that they do. In your name we pray, amen. God talks to us through the book of Ephesians, through the Apostle Paul, and he says, but you, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. But by grace you have been saved through faith, and it's not of yourself. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. If you've decided to be a Christian, you've made that choice to choose Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that's really good news today, isn't it? Amen? And if you're here today and you haven't made that choice yet, you're, you're a creation of God, but you're not a child of God yet, that's really good news for you today also. Because today could be your day. This could be the day that the veil is taken away from your eyes and you see that Jesus died for you, rose again, and paid the price for you. And this could be the day that you become a child of God through grace unmeasured. We've sang the song maybe once or twice the words are really powerful. So I'm going to do this. We're going to sing, we're going to sing the song together. I'm going to have you stand in a minute. But I'm going to sing it through once on the first verse. You're going to remain seated. But if you remember it, sing it nice and loud. And we'll get, that, we'll get it going again. And then I'll ask you to stand and we'll repeat it from the beginning and sing it all the way through.
You may be seated. Uh, just one announcement this morning as far as prayer is concerned. We received word this morning that Bob uh, Meyerd passed away this morning. That's Jenny Hager's dad. Um, so he is in his eternal home this morning. And so just be in prayer for that family. Don't know any funeral plans or anything like that yet. Um, we'll pass them along as we do. Um, but he passed away this morning. So with that said, friends, will you join me in a word of prayer? Gracious God, how amazing your grace is. That your grace would change our lives. But your gift, your free gift, nothing we could do, nothing we could do to earn or deserve it, but your gift says we are enough. That we are more than enough. That we are your children. And so, Father, we just want to come before you and thank you for that gift. We thank you that we got a witness this morning how your grace has been at work in Jordan's life to come to this point of being able to stand before his church family and saying, yes, I want to follow Jesus with my everything. And so we just bless you and we thank you for that gift this morning. And I pray for the rest of us, Lord, on wherever we are on our faith journeys. Will you just continue to grow us by your grace? to continue to live more and more deeply into the image of God that you have created us into so that we can reach and impact this community with your good news, with your gospel. This morning, Lord, we also come before you and we um, pray over um, Bob uh, Meyer's family. Particularly, we pray for the Haggers as they mourn his death. We thank you that he is no longer um, in pain and hurt, but he is with you this morning. And so, Lord, we just pray that you just surround the family as they grieve his loss and make plans of, for funerals and such. Yeah. Lord, surround them. Embrace them this morning. We pray for other needs going on in our church family, both known and unknown. Lord, will you meet us right where we're at? Remind us of your love and your grace. Lord, we also pray for our world. We pray for peace. We pray for hope in difficult spaces. We pray for the missionaries we support here at, Glen, or at Forest Grove, that you would just use them in powerful ways to reach out into this world, that men and women across the world would come to know you. Lord, we know your kingdom is far bigger than just this little gathering here at Forest Grove, but I thank you for this little gathering here at Forest Grove this little glimpse of eternity, this little glimpse where we can come together and we can lift your name high. Or we can join with the saints and all the creatures and the angels in heaven crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. So Lord, let it be so. And Lord, as we hear from your word now this morning, we just ask that you would speak to us through your word. So when we walk out these doors, we walk into this mission field that you've placed us in, that we might better reflect your love, your light, your grace to each person we come into contact with. God, we love you so very much, and we pray all these things in your name. Amen. Sorry about some of the little funky sounds this morning. We... As you can see, we got a new sound system while we were worshiping outside, and so we're getting some of the glitches uh, worked out of it this morning, but uh, hopefully it sounds a whole lot better to you guys out there once we do. So this morning, if you have not been with us, maybe you're a guest of Jordan this morning, or you're just joining us for the first time this morning, 
we are in this series called the Gospel Challenge. It's, it's a challenge that we gave to our congregation back in January to read through the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, three times over the course of this year. Uh, so we're reading through one Gospel a month, and so the month of July here, we have been in the Gospel of Luke. And so for our sermon series, to keep it simple and to help encourage you, I'm doing the sermon passage. My sermon passage is based on the reading for today. So if you've already read the Gospel Challenge this morning, you know it's Luke 19 is where we're finding ourselves this morning. Um, and so I want to invite you to open your Bible with me to Luke 19. And as you're doing that, I'm going to give you, I want to give us just a little bit of context of where Jesus and his followers are at and kind of what is going on. Um, so I grabbed this map out of my office. I think I might have a picture up here. Do we have a, there it is. Um, so the, uh, I like this map because it has all the um, bumps on it to kind of show where all the, the mountains and the low places are at. But anyways, so Jesus is just finishing up his time up on the top there. You could see the Sea of, or the sea of Galilee. He spent his time there. And now he's getting ready to head to Jerusalem. And so to head to Jerusalem, the easiest route is to walk down the Jordan Valley, kind of right down the middle where that red line is, because it's a nice low, flat land. You get just north of the Dead Sea there at the bottom, and all of a sudden you come to this um, kind of flat spot that kind of slowly leads you up to Jerusalem, a high spot on the map. And that area is called Wadi Kelt. And so they're heading up there, but right at the intersection of the Jordan Valley and Wadi Kelt, kind of where it makes that turn, is a city called Jericho. Probably, you may have heard that, of that city before. There's several stories that take place there in the Bible because it's this important intersection. It's this city that a lot of people are going to pass through as they're heading to Jerusalem. And so Jesus and his followers, they're on their way to Jerusalem, and so they're passing through Jericho. And as Jesus is about to pass, or comes up to Jericho, he finds a man who is sitting on the side of the road begging so that his sight would be restored. And so Jesus restores his sight. Then as Jesus was walking, he comes across a man named Zacchaeus. That name might sound familiar to you. Zacchaeus was a local tax collector in Jericho. Um, and so Jesus stops and he has a conversation with Zacchaeus. After he's finishing up his conversation with Zacchaeus, he says these words to Zacchaeus and those who are listening in. He says, Today salvation has come to his house, meaning Zacchaeus' house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. So after saying these words, Jesus begins to tell them a parable. And this parable is where we're going to spend our time this morning. So we're going to be in Luke 19, like I mentioned, and we're going to start, though, at verse 11. And I'm going to read all the way through verse 27. So brothers and sisters, hear the word of the Lord. While they are listening to this, Jesus went on to tell them a parable. Because he was near Jerusalem, and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. He said, A man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. So he called ten of his servants and gave them ten uh, minas. After, the, the, after this, he put the money to work. He said, until, he said, Put the money to work until I come back. But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. He was made king, however, and returned home. When he sent for the servant to whom he had given the money in order to find out what he had gained with it. The first one came and said, sir, your mina was, has earned 10 more. Well done, good and faithful servant. His master replied, because you have been trustworthy in a very small manner, take charge of ten cities. The second one came and said, sir, your mina has earned five more. The master answered, you take charge of five cities. 
Then another servant came and said, Sir, here is your mina. I kept it I have kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and you reap what you did not sow. This master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I am a hard man, taking out what I did, not putting in, and reaping what I did not sow. Why then didn't you put my money on deposit so that when I came back, I could have collected it at least with interest? Then he said to those standing by, take his mina away from him and give it to the one who has 10 minas. Sir, they said, he already has 10. He replied, I tell you that everyone who has more will be given. But as the one who has nothing, even what they have will be taken away. But those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I got this uh, pink bag. I actually got it from Lin Gan, one of our missionaries. And if I was to... uh, ask you to take this bag and put it in my boot, what would you do? You'd probably look at the front door at my house and you'd find my boot there and you'd stick it in or put it on top of it, right? But if you were living down south and I said, hey, put this in my boot, you would probably grab this bag and go out to my car, open what we would call the trunk and stick it in there, right? You see, context matters, doesn't it? You see, depending on your context, your, your mental models of how things work in the world, you will respond differently when you hear different things. This seems to be the case with the disciples this morning. They were still listening to Jesus through a mental model that said Jesus was going to ride into Jerusalem, overthrow the Roman government. But Jesus had in mind the kingdom of God. So the words the disciples heard in Jesus' conversation with Zacchaeus, well, they didn't hear him quite as they were supposed to be heard. It seems that those who were listening in on Jesus' conversation made a couple of false assumptions that Jesus wanted to correct. And so we see these corrections beginning already in verse 11. You see, the first mistake they made was that in hearing Jesus talking about salvation coming to Zacchaeus' house on that day, it made him think that the kingdom of God was going to come right in that moment. They thought they were going to finish their walk up Wadi Kal to Jerusalem, and when they got to Jerusalem, they were going to overthrow the Roman government, and that was going to be it. Yes, they did continue their journey up to Jerusalem, but instead of taking down the Roman government, Jesus was arrested. He was humiliated. He was hung on a cross for, sin, or for a crime he did not commit, only to die a horrific and public death. But the death on the cross was not the end of the story. You see, Jesus would rise again three days later and then ascend to be with the Father 40 days later. You see, in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, Jesus began to usher in the kingdom of God. But the disciples struggled to process this. They thought the kingdom of God was going to come right then. But what they had to realize is that the kingdom of God would not come again until Jesus came back to make all things new. And we're still waiting today for that glorious day when Jesus will come again to make all things new, aren't we? When sin and pain and tears will be no more. You see, we see glimpses of the kingdom of God all around us if we, if we have eyes to see. But yet it's not fully realized, and it won't be fully realized until Jesus comes again. 
Sometimes we use the phrase, the already but not yet. We can glimpse it today, but we won't fully realize it until Jesus comes again. The second correction I think that Jesus wants to make is that Jerusalem was going to be key to to Jesus gaining his kingdom, but it wasn't the most important thing. Think about it when there's a war breaking out. One of the things the army is always wanting to do is go and take the capital city. It's a sign of saying that they have successfully uh, entered into that country and successfully achieved some of their goals. And so the people that were following Jesus figured, okay, if we go into Jerusalem, this, this key place in the religious world, a key place for the Roman government as well, and we overthrow Jerusalem, well then surely, surely the kingdom of God would come then. You see, Jerusalem was central for Luke in his writing of this gospel. The story takes place, the the key part of Jesus' death and resurrection takes place in Jerusalem. But that's not where it will end. A chapter will end in Jerusalem but not the story, friends. You see, yes, Jesus' kingdom took, we see a piece of the story taking place in a city, but his kingdom was not about a city. His kingdom was about the world. So to remind his listeners again of what the kingdom of God is all about, Jesus begins telling them a parable. And in this parable, we meet three primary characters. The first character is a nobleman, which represents Jesus. The second character, the servants, represents the disciples. And the third character we we encounter, the citizens, may represent lost sinners. You see, as the parable starts, we are told that the nobleman had to travel a great distance so that he could be appointed king. This was actually a common practice in that day. For example, we have a written historical account that Archelaus, the son of Herod the Great, upon his father's death, actually went to Rome to be crowned his father's successor. Typically, without cars and all the fancy technology we have today, this journey would take a really long time. So in this parable, we know that the nobleman is leaving to be crowned king, but we have no clue when this noble man will return. You see, uh, what Jesus is getting at here is that he was going to leave this world for a period of time. And he wasn't telling them when he would come back. In fact, the scriptures tell us that even Jesus didn't know when he would return. Only the Father knows the day and the time when that would take place. So while the nobleman is gone, he, he wants his servants to continue the work that he had begun. And so one of the ways they could continue that um, is by taking care of some of the finances. So he took ten servants, and he gave them each a mina. After, the servant, after giving the servants a mina, uh, he instructs them to put the money to work until he comes back. You see, the nobleman expects that when he returns, they will have taken the minas and used them to increase the number of minas they have. The nobleman is clear that he does not want the minas to just sit around and collect dust. He wants them to be put to good use. He wants them to increase, but he also doesn't tell them when he's going to return. Will it be in a couple days or... A couple years? They don't know. Then we also meet another group of people. A group of subjects who we are told hated the nobleman and did not want to see him become king. They they went as far as to send a delegation after the nobleman so when the nobleman appeared to be um, appointed as king, they were, trying, they were going to try to woo the leaders into saying, don't let him be our king. These citizens represent the lost sinners who would reject Jesus throughout his ministry and one day would demand that he be crucified 
when he came before the crowds in Jerusalem as the king of the Jews. But nonetheless, the noble man did become king, and he returned just as he promised his servants he would do. And when he came back, the nobleman sent for the servants to come to him so that he could learn what was done with the minas. One man came to the nobleman and said that he had turned his minas into, from one into a total of 11 minas. The nobleman responded, well done, my good servant. The next servant came in and he had six minas. He had taken his one and added another five to it. A noble man was proud of him as well. Then the third servant came in, and he only had the same mina that he had been given. This third servant did not want to take the risk to grow the mina like the nobleman wanted him to. Really, this third servant and the other two had very different visions of the kingdom. Now, I, told, I know I told you that there was really three main characters in this story. But actually, there's four. The fourth character is this. It's the Minas. You see, the Minas represent our lives. In the Heidelberg Catechism, we're reminded in question and answer one that I am not my own, but I belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, just as the nobleman gave each of his servants the meanness, we all have been given a life. But our life is really not our own, is it? It belongs to God. We all have been given gifts and talents to further the kingdom of God. Some of you have the gift of, of building things. How are you using your gifts to further the kingdom of God? Some of you have the gift of teaching others. How are you using your gifts to further the kingdom of God? Some of you have the gift of building wealth. How are you going to use that gift to further the kingdom of God? Some of you have the gift of hospitality. How are you going to use that gift to further the kingdom of God? Some of you have the gift of being a really good friend. How are you going to use that gift to further the kingdom of God? Some of you have the, the gift of, of wisdom and knowledge. How are you going to use that to further the kingdom of God? Some of you have musical gifts. How are you going to use that to further the kingdom of God. And the list of questions could go on. But the question the Mina poses to us this morning is this. How are you going to spend your life, the life that God has given you, to further the kingdom of God? I think of a person who I talked to recently who uh, is widowed, and he found out another man had just been widowed, and he took him out for dinner. I think of a team of people who shows up here bright and early on Sunday mornings to get the technology, to practice the songs, to get stuff set up for the morning. I think of some of our mission partners who are sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ in some really, really difficult places around the world. I think of a, a person who recently took a couple of vacation days to, to take care of some projects around the church. See, friends, it's an incredible honor and privilege for me to serve alongside of you. But the question I have to ask myself every day, and the question I think we have to ask ourselves each every day, is this. How am I going to spend the life that God has given me today to further the kingdom of God? This morning, as you think about that, and you reflect on that a little bit, I want to read a poem as a way of ending our time together. This is a poem written by a missionary who comes out of Great Britain by the name of Charles Thomas Studd. Charles uh, served as a missionary in China, India, and various places throughout Africa. He died in 1931. But here are these words 
and reflect on them with me this morning. This poem is called, Only One Life Twill Soon Be Passed. Two little lines I have heard one day, traveling along life's busy way, bringing conviction to my heart, and from my mind would not depart. Only one life twill soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one. Soon will its fleeting hours be done. Then in that day, my Lord to meet and stand before his judgment seat. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, the still small voice, gently pleads for a better choice, bidding me selfish aims to leave and to God's holy will to cleave. Only what's done, or only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, a few brief years, each one with its burdens, hopes, and fears. Each one with its clays I must fulfill, living for self or in his will. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. When this bright world would tempt me sore, when Satan would have a victory score, when self would seek to have its way, then help me, Lord, with joy to say, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Give me, Father, a purpose deep. In joy or sorrow, thy word to keep. Faithful and true, whate'er the strife, pleasing thee in my daily life. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Oh, let my love with fervor burn. And from this world, now let me turn, living for thee and thee alone, bringing thee pleasure on thy throne. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one. Now let me say, thy will be done. And when at last I hear the call, I know I'll say, "Twas worth it all. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And when I am dying, how happy I'll be if the lamp of my life has burned out for thee. Gracious God, we thank you for this life that you have given to us. This invitation to be about your kingdom. Sometimes being about your kingdom doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It pushes against some of the mental models that we have in this world. And yet you call us to live our lives to bring you glory to further your kingdom. And so, Lord, I pray that we just continue to do that more and more each and every day. Not my will, but yours be done. Let that be our heart's cry today. We pray this in Jesus' name. stand and sing as we close our service today.
done for Christ will last. Friends, as you go into this day, into this week, might we long for that day when Jesus comes back to make all things new. Amen. But until that day, let's live our lives for the kingdom of God. And as you go into this week, go in this blessing. May God seeking comfort find you. May his loving arms bind you. May his might protect you and his wisdom direct you. And may the joy of Jesus Christ be with you both now and forevermore. Amen. Friends, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And have a great week. Mm-hmm.